Good morning. It's nice to be with you this morning through the marvels of modern technology. Our word of God this morning is based on the words of our gospel lesson this morning John in John chapter 6. And since that's already been read, I won't read it again at this time. Dear brothers and sisters who hunger and thirst after Jesus, the bread of life. A few years ago, I was conducting an every member visit in one of my congregations. And one of the questions I asked the members was this. What do you feel, or in your opinion, what is one thing that our church does well? And I'll never forget what one man told me, with, almost without flinching. He said, Pastor, we're good at eating. If there's anything we do well, it's eating. I think those words would aptly apply to the people in our lesson in John chapter 6 this morning. They were good at eating. They were good at eating food for their bodies. But we learned that when it came to food for their souls, the soul food that Jesus wanted to serve them, that they didn't want. We read in John chapter 6, beginning at verse 23. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Why were these people going to such great lengths to get on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, back to Capernaum, to find Jesus. Well, remember what has just happened hours before that. Jesus had just miraculously fed 5,000 men, not including men, women and children, with no more than a, a lunch that a mother had packed for her, her son, two dried fish and five little barley loaves. The people had followed Jesus to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, eager to hear him teach, perhaps to see him do some miracles. But they hadn't thought about taking any provisions with them. And as the day was growing closer to a close, Jesus had compassion on them because they were hungry. He turned to his disciples and, and looked to them for a solution, and they didn't have any except this little boy's lunch. Jesus gave thanks for it, and then he began with his creating power to multiply that fish and those loaves so that everybody, over 5,000 people, had had plenty to eat and didn't need any more. And then his disciples collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. Absolutely incredible. The eyes of these people then were coming to see Jesus because... They wanted more. They, they looked to Jesus to, to help, and he had graciously provided for them. He, he gave them an unmistakable sign that he was, in fact, the Messiah God had promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through the prophets like Isaiah. This had to be the one sent from God. But the miraculous feeding didn't go unnoticed by these people. Oh, they noticed. They did more than that. They chased after Jesus. And at first we would think, well, that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing for people to, to want to be near Jesus. But Jesus knew the motives of their heart, and they weren't pure. They, they did chase him down, and they did want to be near him, but not because, he, because of the things he was teaching them, not because of the spiritual food he wanted to give them, but as Jesus says, because they ate and had their fill. You see, they were looking to Jesus to be their bread king. In other words, a king that would provide food for them. 
a government welfare program. After all, why should they work for food if Jesus could give it to them for free? These people had growling stomachs that were only satisfied for a short time. But their growling stomachs sort of outgrowled the needs of their starving souls. In his compassion, Jesus is always willing to help people who are in need, who don't have the basic necessities of life. He is not going to allow his people to go without the very basics. He's, he's promised that he will take care of our basics, our food, our clothing, a, a place to cover our heads. But he had not come for that primary purpose. He had not come to be the bread king or the government welfare program. These people needed to go home and get back to work. To take care of the crops in their fields and the, the cattle under their care. Because it was through this work that God was going to provide for them. Remember, this is what St. Paul told the Thessalonian Christians. He said this, if anyone does not work, he should not eat. And this is in perfect keeping then with what God had taught Adam way back in the Garden of Eden, right after the fall. He says, it is through the sweat of your brow that you will eat. Do you see yourself mirrored in the nameless faces in this crowd that had chased after Jesus? Are you hungry? Is your stomach growling? Maybe it's, a, it's been a tight month, or, or maybe coming off of COVID, you're, you're struggling to make ends meet. Then by all means, come to Jesus for food. Ask Him. Rely on Him to provide you with the basic necessities of life. If you've fallen on hard times, if you're struggling, then please, come to me. Come to the leaders in our congregation. Give us, as your brothers and sisters in Christ, an opportunity to reflect his love to you and help you out in some way. That's what we want to do. And it's through his people, then, that Jesus often provides these immediate needs of the people. He provides the food and the clothing that, that people need. But under, understand, then, that Jesus is not just the Savior of your soul. He is the Savior of all of you, soul and body. But a word of caution. Don't mistake Jesus or his church for a welfare program. We are not primarily involved in physical welfare. We are primarily a lighthouse, a beacon for the light of the gospel in our community and in our world. We are primarily a gospel-proclaiming organization. That's what Jesus has called us to do. God's will for you is the same as it was for Adam and for those Thessalonian Christians. He wants you to work. He, he wants you to earn your basic necessities through your, your sweat and your hard labor. If you're down and out, if think ends are, are having a hard time making the ends meet, then absolutely Come to Jesus for food. Come to Jesus for help. Come to his people. We will be happy to do whatever we can to help you. But your need shouldn't be a result of your unwillingness to work. Nor should your need be a result of spending what you have earned on luxuries. On, on the fact that you have a TV that covers an entire wall in your house. Or and the fact that you drive a luxury automobile or you carry a Louis Vuitton or Prada, a handbag, or wear Jimmy Choo's shoes. That's, that, that's all whipped cream and cherry on top of the basic necessities. And it's true that for, for many people, at least in our country, God has graciously, abundantly provided so much more than the basic necessities. Is your stomach growling? then absolutely come to Jesus for food. He will provide food, the necessities for your body. However, even more than providing for the necessities of your bodies, Jesus provides bread for your souls. This was the purpose for his coming. And 
to, was to this spiritual level then that Jesus wanted to lift the hearts and minds of the people that had crowded to him. This is what we read. Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The transition from the physical plane to the spiritual plane in this conversation didn't happen so quickly or easily. The the people's souls were, were starving, almost to the point of death, beyond their even recognizing that they, they were starving, that they were hurting. They didn't want to work for the food that, that feeds the body. That they wanted Jesus to give them. But notice in their question, they wanted to work for the heavenly food. But that was all backwards, wasn't it? God wants you to work for your physical food. He wants to give you freely the spiritual food. Patiently, Jesus called them away from their good works and to put their faith, to, to call them to believe in Him as their Savior and their spiritual provider. Now it is clear that the people understood what Jesus was saying about Himself, namely that He was the Messiah promised and the one whom God had sent from heaven. But they wanted more signs. It's incredible, isn't it? It's, it's almost as if they had forgotten why they had chased Jesus to the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the first place. Why he had just fed over 5,000 of them, if that wasn't sign enough. But they hungered and thirsted for more physical signs. They, they wanted Jesus to do for them what Moses had done for them in the wilderness, for their ancestors. Right? Moses pleaded to God after the people had complained, and God patiently, graciously answered that request by providing manna every morning and quail in the evening for the people to eat. It was free food. They had it for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. Now, it's true that the people complained against Moses because it wasn't too long before they got sick of eating the same old thing all the time. And it's also true that it wasn't Moses who provided that food, but it, as Jesus pointed out, it was the Father in heaven who had provided that food for them. But those facts didn't seem to, to matter to them. They still wanted more signs. They wanted their stomachs to be filled and yet, that's not why Jesus had come. He had come primarily to fill their souls. Their souls with food so that they would not hunger and thirst for spiritual food. It's pretty easy for us to lob attacks over the centuries at, at these misguided souls who crowded around Jesus. But what about you? For what kind of food have you come to Jesus? 
You see, friends, this conversation is really a conversation about priorities, isn't it? Which is more important, the food for your bodies or the food for your souls? Both are important, but which is most important? Jesus is pointing out to us that it's the food for our souls that is most important. But this was the food that the people didn't seem to care anything for. Jesus wanted to provide both for them. They were only interested in food for their bodies. The spiritual starvation they were suffering didn't seem to bother them. But not us, right? We're, we're, we're not like these people in our lesson, are we? After all, you're here this morning worshiping and you're listening to me on a TV screen rather than live and in person. Wow, that takes some dedication, doesn't it? But are you listening? Have you been actively participating in worship this morning? Lord's Supper is being served this morning. Have you prepared yourself to receive that supper yet? Or did you even know it was going to be served this morning? Maybe your spiritual starvation or hunger would be more obvious if we touched on the home life. You know, how many husbands don't grumble and growl at their wives when the dinner isn't served, put out on the table at just the right time? How many children don't cry out to their moms all the time about how hungry they are? And yet, would those same voices complain when mom or dad forgets to read the family devotions? Would the same mouths that cry out to mom to feed their tummies cry out to Jesus to feed their souls? As people who call ourselves Christians, it's downright embarrassing, isn't it? And more than being embarrassing, it's shameful, but shameful to the point of being deadly. God tells us that when we have our priorities switched and we put the physical ahead of the spiritual, we're sinning against Him. He always wants Him and His Word to be number one in our lives, our chief concern, and He promises to take care of the rest. When we worry about the rest and forget the first, we've sinned against God, and that sin deserves God's anger and punishment right now and forever that's what we confess in worship isn't it but just as Jesus was patient with those people in our lesson so Jesus is abundantly patient with us and more than patience then he gives us what we lack he he, he comes as the bread of life from heaven that satisfying food and just consider how satisfying this heavenly food is. By nature, that is from your birth, we are all born lacking a righteousness or perfection that God demands of us. And lacking that righteousness or perfection, then we lack confidence in God's favor. We lack confidence to stand before God, and rightly so. But by nature, from our birth, we're also born with a stain of sin. Sin that then shows itself in our thoughts, words, and actions for the rest of our earthly lives. That sin then oppresses us with the guilt that goes with it. And that those ugly, oppressive, guilty feelings rob us of all peace that we would have with God. And taking away confidence and peace, we have no joy and certainly no hope. How wonderfully filling Jesus the bread of life is. First of all, he came to be and to provide that perfection and righteousness that we lacked. Notice that's what Jesus did in our lesson today. Whenever we read the gospel lesson, it's good for us to, to see Jesus doing something for us, doing something in our place. So when Jesus had compassion on these people and he fed them, he was being righteous before God. He was doing what the, perf the perfect thing God wanted him to do. He was doing it for us, for all the times we have failed to look with compassion on people in need. For all the times we've sort of put on the blinders so we don't see 
others around us who have needs because we don't want the inconvenience. Then Jesus, while the people were struggling in their, in their thoughts to raise them from the, the physical to the spiritual, rather than becoming frustrated as I might have been or, or you might have been, Jesus remained perfectly patient. He did that for you to be your righteousness and perfection before God. So what God requires of you in perfection and righteousness, through faith in Jesus, this bread from heaven, He credits you with that righteousness, that perfection. And having that righteousness and perfection, it makes a difference in your relationship with God because now you know you can enjoy His favor and you can stand confidently before Him. But, but as we've come to expect from our God, He does so much more than we can ask or imagine. He's so abundantly gracious to us. Jesus didn't stop then with, with being our righteousness. Jesus then did something incredible to take away our sin and the guilt of our sin. He offered Himself up, not on a silver platter, but on a wooden cross. He he offered up his life and poured out his blood to take away those sins. God poured out his anger against us on the cross, on Jesus. And in that same event of punishing Jesus, God was saving us from our, from our guilt and our sins, taking it all away. And to demonstrate to you that God holds no grudges, that there are no strings attached to this bread from heaven that God has given you. He raised Jesus from the dead. Because Jesus lives, you can be absolutely confident that God has provided the righteousness that you need for you. You can be absolutely confident that your sins and all the guilt has been completely removed you can be confident that even though you die, you will live again. This is the bread from heaven. Jesus is the bread from heaven. Always give us this bread, we ask Jesus. Give us this bread that provides us with the, the confidence and the peace and the joy and the hope to live with our God. Pastor, we're good at eating. If, there one, if there's one thing we're good at, it's eating. I'll never forget that comment. I don't know if it was said in sarcasm. I don't remember if it was just an honest evaluation from, from, a, from a very astute observer. But in a way, I hope it's always true. I hope it's always true of the members of Redeemer Lutheran that we hunger after the bread of life, that we are good at eating the bread of life. Because God serves Him up for us in His Word as we gather here for worship, as, as the sermons are preached, as the Bible lessons are read, as Bible classes are conducted. Jesus, the bread of life, is being served for your soul. In the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper, which we have a privilege to, to celebrate today, Jesus offers the, the, the rich delicacies of spiritual food for you. He gives you Himself. And through faith, you eat, you dine on Jesus, the bread of life. And if along the way we get to enjoy some barbecue together, why, that's just gravy on top. But let it always be said, that the people at Redeemer Lutheran hunger and thirst for the bread of life above everything else. Are you hungry? Is your stomach growling? Is your soul growling? Come to Jesus for food. Dinner is served. It's been a pleasure being with you this morning through the marvels of modern technology and I look forward to joining you next week live and in person. Until then I pray that you each and every one of you has a safe and prosperous week. Don't forget to daily dine 
on the bread of life. And the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.